Universe Books The Power of Your Subconscious Mind By Dr. Joseph Murphy, Ph.D., 1963 This is an audiovisual project, derived from the original classic book. Produced by Universe Books Channel All Rights Reserved Chapter 4, Mental Healings in Ancient Times Through the ages, people in every continent, climate, and culture have instinctively known that somewhere there resided a healing power that could restore the abilities and functions of a person's body to its normal state of efficiency and good health. They believed that this strange power could be invoked under certain conditions and that if it were invoked properly, the alleviation of human suffering would follow. The history of all nations presents testimony in support of this belief in the early history of the world, the power of secretly influencing men for good or evil, including the healing of the sick, was said to be possessed by priests, priestesses, and holy people. They claimed to possess powers derived directly from God that included the healing of the sick. The procedures and processes of healing varied throughout the world, but they generally included supplications and offerings to the God, various ceremonies, such as the laying on of hands and incantations, and the use of amulets, talismans, rings, relics, and images. For example, in the religions of antiquity priests in the ancient temples gave drugs to their patients and practiced hypnotic suggestions as they went to sleep. The patients were told that the gods would surely visit them in their sleep and heal them. Many healings followed. The devotees of Hecate were told to mix lizards with resin, frankincense, and myrrh and pound all this together in the open air under the crescent moon. After performing these bizarre and mysterious rites, they prayed to the goddess, took the potion they had just compounded, and went to sleep. If their faith was strong enough, they saw the goddess in a dream. This rite, which sounds so strange, even fantastic, to our ears, was often followed by healings. People in ancient times worked out many effective ways to tap the incredible power of the subconscious mind and use it for healing. While they knew that these procedures worked, however, they did not understand how or why they worked. Today, we can see that they were using potent suggestions to the subconscious mind. The rituals and potions and amulets appealed powerfully to the imagination of people and favored the acceptance by the subconscious mind of the insistent suggestions given by the healer. But the work of healing was done by the patient's own subconscious mind. In all ages unofficial healers have obtained remarkable results in cases where authorized medical skill had failed and the patients had given up hope. This gives cause for thought. How do these healers in all parts of the world affect their cures? The answer is that these healings take place because the blind belief of the sick person released the healing power resident in his or her subconscious mind. The more fantastic and peculiar the remedies and methods used by the healers, the more likely the patients were to believe that anything so strange must be unusually powerful. Their aroused emotional state made it easier for them to accept the suggestion of health, in both their conscious and subconscious mind. This point will be discussed at greater length in the next chapter. Biblical Accounts on the Use of the Subconscious Powers What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Mark 11, verse 24 Reread this passage and pay close attention to the difference in tenses. The verbs believe and receive are in the present, but the verb shall have is in the future. The inspired writer is telling us something of the greatest importance by the seemingly minor difference in the grammar of the sentence. If we believe and accept as true the fact that our desire has already been accomplished and fulfilled, that it is already completed, then its realization will follow as a thing in the future. The success of this technique relies on the confident conviction that the thought, the idea, the picture is already fact in mind. In order for anything to have substance in the realm of mind, it must be thought of as actually existing. Here in a few cryptic words is a concise and specific direction for making use of the creative power of thought by impressing upon the subconscious the particular thing you desire. Your thought, idea, plan, or purpose is as real on its own plane as your hand or your heart. In following the biblical technique, you completely eliminate from your mind all consideration of conditions, circumstances, or anything that might imply a negative outcome. You are planting a seed, concept, in the mind that, if you leave it undisturbed, will infallibly germinate into external fruition. The prime condition that Jesus insisted upon was faith. Over and over again you read in the Bible, according to your faith is it done unto you. If you plant certain types of seeds in the ground, 
you have faith they will grow after their kind. This is the way of seeds, and trusting the laws of growth and agriculture, you know that the seeds will come forth after their kind. The faith that is described in the Bible is a way of thinking, an attitude of mind, an inner certitude, knowing that the idea you fully accept in your conscious mind will be embodied in your subconscious mind and made manifest. Faith is, in a sense, accepting as true what your reason and senses deny. It is dosing down, refusing to listen to the little, rational, analytical, conscious mind and embracing an attitude of complete reliance on the inner power of your subconscious mind. Here is one of the best known examples of the biblical technique of healing, and when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yeah, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. Matt 9, verse 28 to 30. By saying, according to your faith be it unto you, Jesus was openly appealing to the cooperation of the subconscious mind of the blind men. Their faith was their great expectancy, their inner feeling, their inner conviction that something miraculous would happen, that their prayer would be answered. And therefore it was. This is the time-honored technique of healing, utilized alike by all healing groups throughout the world, regardless of religious affiliation. In saying, see that no man know it, Jesus was urging the healed patients not to discuss their healing with others. If they did so, they might be harassed by the skeptical and derogatory criticisms of the unbelieving. This in turn might have tended to undo the benefits they had received at the hand of Jesus by depositing thoughts of fear, doubt, and anxiety in the subconscious mind. For with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they came out. Luke 4, verse 36. When the sick came to Jesus to be healed, they were healed by their own faith, together with his faith and understanding of the healing power of the subconscious mind. Whatever he decreed, he felt inwardly to be true. He and the people needing help were in the one universal subjective mind, and his silent inner knowing and conviction of the healing power changed the negative destructive patterns in the patient's subconscious. The resultant healings were the automatic response to the internal mental change. His command was his appeal to the subconscious mind of the patients plus his awareness, feeling, and absolute trust in, the response of the subconscious mind to the words that he spoke with authority. Miracles at various shrines throughout the world. On every continent, in every land, there are shrines at which cures take place. Some are world famous. Others are known only to those who live nearby. Whether celebrated or obscure, the healings that happen at these shrines happen for the same reasons and by way of the same powers of the subconscious mind. I have visited several of the famous shrines in Japan. The central focus of the world-renowned shrine of Daibutsu is a gigantic bronze statue, 42 feet tall. It depicts Buddha seated with folded hands, his head inclined in an attitude of profound contemplative ecstasy. Here I saw young and old making offerings at its feet. Money, fruit, rice, and oranges were offered. Candles were lit, incense was burned, and prayers of petition were recited. I listened to the chant of a young girl as she intoned a prayer, bowed low, and placed two oranges as an offering. She was thanking Buddha for restoring her voice. She had lost her voice, but it was restored at the shrine. Her simple faith that Buddha would give her back her singing voice if she followed a certain ritual. Fasted, and made certain offerings had helped to kindle faith and expectancy. The result was a conditioning of her mind to the point of belief her subconscious mind then responded to her belief the power of imagination and blind belief cannot be overstated. A wondrous example of this is the case of a relative of mine in Perth, in Western Australia, who suffered from tuberculosis. His lungs were badly diseased. His son decided to help his father heal himself he went to his father's home and told him he had recently met a wandering monk with strange powers. This monk had just returned from a long stay at one of the most celebrated healing shrines in Europe. There he had acquired a small fragment of the true cross, set in a ring that dated back to the Middle Ages. Over the centuries, countless sufferers had been healed after touching the ring or the fragment of the cross. When the son had heard this he had told the monk about his father's illness and begged to borrow the ring. The monk had agreed. The son then gave the monk a free will offering of the equivalent of $500. 
when the son showed his father the ring, the older man practically snatched it from him. He clasped the ring to his chest, prayed silently, and went to sleep. In the morning he was healed. All the clinic's tests proved negative. Healings of this sort happen all the time. What is most significant about this one is that the son's amazing story was totally made up. In fact, he had picked up a splinter of ordinary wood from the sidewalk, taken it to a jeweler, and had it set in a gold ring of antique design. He then gave it to his father. You know, of course, it was not the splinter of wood from the sidewalk that healed the father. No, it was his imagination aroused to an intense degree, plus the confident expectancy of a perfect healing. Imagination was joined to faith or subjective feeling, and the union of the two brought about a healing through the power of his subconscious mind. The father never learned of the trick that had been played upon him. If he had, he might well have had a relapse. Instead, his tuberculosis never returned. He remained completely cured and passed away from other causes 15 years later, at the age of 89. One Universal Healing Principle it is a well-known fact that all the various schools of healing bring about documented cures of the most wonderful character. The most obvious conclusion that strikes your mind is that there must be some underlying organ and process that is common to them all. Indeed there is. The organ of healing is the subconscious mind, and the process of healing is faith. Think deeply about these fundamental truths. You possess mental functions that have been distinguished by designating one the conscious mind and the other the subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind is constantly amenable to the power of suggestion. Your subconscious mind has complete control of the functions, conditions, and sensations of your body. You surely know that symptoms of almost any disease can be induced in hypnotic subjects by suggestion. For example, a subject in the hypnotic state can develop a high temperature, flushed face, or chills according to the nature of the suggestion given. You can suggest to the person that he is paralyzed and cannot walk, and it will be so. You can hold a cup of cold water under the nose of the hypnotic subject and tell him, this is full of pepper, smell it. He will sneeze violently and repeatedly. What do you think caused him to sneeze? The water, or the suggestion? If someone tells you he is allergic to timothy grass, you can place a synthetic flower or an empty glass in front of his nose, when he is in a hypnotic state, and tell him it is timothy grass he will develop his usual allergic symptoms. This shows us that the cause of the symptoms is in the subconscious mind. Curing the symptoms also takes place in the subconscious mind. Different schools of medicine, such as osteopathy, chiropractic, qigong, acupuncture, and naturopathy, all produce remarkable healings. So do the rites and ceremonies of the various religious beliefs throughout the world. It is obvious that all of these healings are brought about through the subconscious mind, the only healer there is. Notice how the subconscious mind heals a cut on your finger. It knows exactly how to do it. The doctor dresses the wound and says, nature heals it. But nature is nothing more than another name for natural law, the law of the subconscious mind. The instinct of self-preservation is the first law of nature, and self-preservation is the foremost function of the subconscious mind. Your strongest instinct is the most potent of all auto-suggestions. Widely different theories. Many different theories of healing have been advanced by different religious sects and prayer therapy groups. There are a great number who claim that because their practice produces results, their theory therefore must be right. As we have seen in this chapter, this cannot be correct. As you know, there are many varieties of healing. Franz Anton Mesmer, 1734-1815, an Austrian physician who practiced in Paris, discovered that by applying magnets to a diseased body, he could cure that disease miraculously. He also performed cures with various other pieces of glass and metal. Later, he abandoned the use of these objects in favor of passing his hands over the patient's body. He claimed that the real source of his cures was what he called animal magnetism. He theorized that some mysterious magnetic substance was transmitted from the healer's hands to the patient. Mesmer lent his name to this method of treating disease, which came to be called mesmerism. Today we know it as hypnotism. Other physicians, jealous of Mesmer's success, claimed that all his healings were due to suggestion and nothing else. When pressed, however, they had to admit that they did not know how this power of suggestion created such amazing effects. 
All of these groups, psychiatrists, psychologists, osteopaths, chiropractors, physicians, and religious groups of every variety, are using the one universal power resident in the subconscious mind. Each may proclaim the healings are due to their theory, but the truth is far different. The process of all healing is a definite, positive, mental attitude, an inner attitude, or a way of thinking, called faith. Healing is due to a confident expectancy that acts as a powerful suggestion to the subconscious mind, releasing its healing potency. One person does not heal by a different power than another. It is true that both may have their own theories or methods, but there is only one process of healing, and that is faith. There is only one healing power, namely, your subconscious mind. Select whatever theory, belief, and method that calls out to you. You can rest assured, if you have faith, you will get results. Views of Paracelsus Philippus Paracelsus, a famous Swiss alchemist and physician, who lived from 1493 to 1541, was a great healer in his day. He stated what is now an obvious scientific fact when he said, whether the object of your faith be real or false, you will nevertheless obtain the same effects. Thus, if I believed in St. Peter's statue as I should have believed in St. Peter himself, I shall obtain the same effects that I should have obtained from St. Peter. But that is superstition. Faith, however, produces miracles, and whether it is true or false faith, it will always produce the same wonders. The views of Paracelsus were echoed in the 16th century by Pietro Pomponazzi, an Italian philosopher, who wrote, we can easily conceive the marvelous effects which confidence and imagination can produce, particularly when both qualities are reciprocated between the subjects and the person who influences them. The cures attributed to the influence of certain relics are the effect of their imagination and confidence. Quacks and philosophers know that if the bones of any skeleton were put in place of the saint's bones, the sick would nonetheless experience beneficial effects, if they believed that they were veritable relics. Think what this implies. If you believe in the power of saints' bones, or in the healing properties of certain waters, or, like my Australian relative, in the miraculous effects of a fragment of wood, you will get results because of the powerful suggestion given to your subconscious mind. It is the latter that does the healing. Bernheim's Experiments Hippolyte Bernheim was professor of medicine at Nancy, France, early in the 20th century. He was one of the first to explain how a physician's suggestion to the patient took effect because of the force of the subconscious mind. Bernheim relates the story of a man whose tongue was paralyzed. Every form of treatment was tried, with no success at all. Then one day the man's doctor announced that he had learned of a new instrument that was certain to relieve his problem. The doctor then put a pocket thermometer in the patient's mouth. The patient imagined this was the instrument that was to save him. In a few moments he cried out joyfully that he could once more move his tongue freely. Bernheim continues, among our cases, facts of the same sort will be found. A young girl came into my office, having suffered from complete loss of speech for nearly four weeks. After making sure of the diagnosis, I told my students that loss of speech sometimes yielded instantly to electricity, which might act simply by its suggestive influence. I sent for the induction apparatus. I applied my hand over the larynx and moved a little and said, now you can speak aloud. In an instant I made her say A, then B, then Maria. She continued to speak distinctly, the loss of voice had disappeared. Here Bernheim is showing the power of faith and expectancy on the part of the patient, which acts as a powerful suggestion to the subconscious mind. Producing a blister by suggestion. Bernheim states that he produced a blister on the back of a patient's neck by applying a postage stamp and suggesting to the patient that it was a fly plaster. This sort of demonstration has been confirmed by the experiments and experiences of many doctors in many parts of the world. These leave no doubt that structural changes in the body can be brought about as a result of oral suggestion to patients. The cause of bloody stigmata. Hemorrhages and bloody stigmata can be induced by means of suggestion. As a demonstration of this, Dr. Embaru put a subject into a hypnotic trance, then gave him the following suggestion, at 4 o'clock this afternoon, after the hypnosis, you will come into my office, sit down in this armchair and fold your arms across your chest. Your nose will then begin to bleed. That afternoon, 
the young man did exactly as he had been told. After he crossed his arms, several drops of blood came from his left nostril. On another occasion, the same investigator traced a patient's name on both his forearms with the dull point of an instrument while the patient was in a hypnotic trance. Baru then said, at four o'clock this afternoon you will go to sleep. Your arms will bleed along the lines I have traced, and your name will appear written on your arms in letters of blood. The patient was carefully observed that afternoon. At four o'clock he fell asleep. On his left arm the letters stood out in bright relief, and in several places there were drops of blood. Although the letters gradually faded, they were still faintly visible three months afterward. These facts demonstrate at once the correctness of the two fundamental propositions previously stated, namely, the constant amenability of the subconscious mind to the power of suggestion and the perfect control that the subconscious mind exercises over the functions, sensations, and conditions of the body. All the foregoing phenomena dramatize vividly abnormal conditions induced by suggestion. They are conclusive proof that as a man thinks in his heart, subconscious mind, so is he. Healing Points in Review Remind yourself frequently that the healing power is in your subconscious mind. Know that faith is like a seed planted in the ground, it grows after its kind. Plant the idea, seed, in your mind, water, and fertilize it with expectancy, and it will become manifest. The idea you have for a book, new invention, or play is real in your mind. This is why you can believe you have it now. Believe in the reality of your idea, plan, or invention, and as you do, it will become manifest. In praying for another, know that your silent inner knowing of wholeness, beauty, and perfection can change the negative patterns of the other's subconscious mind and bring about wonderful results. The miraculous healings you hear about at various shrines are due to imagination and blind faith that act on the subconscious mind, releasing the healing power. All disease originates in the mind. Nothing appears on the body unless there is a mental pattern corresponding to it. The symptoms of almost any disease can be induced in you by hypnotic suggestion. This shows you the power of your thought. There is only one process of healing and that is faith. There is only one healing power, namely, your subconscious mind. Whether the object of your faith is real or false, you will get results. Your subconscious mind responds to the thought in your mind. Look upon faith as a thought in your mind, and that will suffice. Well, here we finished this chapter of the book. Continue to listen in the next chapter. If you liked this video, if it brought a valuable information to you, you can help us clicking the like button, it is a positive sign for YouTube to suggest this audiobook to other people, and help the channel's growth. If you think that this video made your reading easier, if you think that it made your reading faster and more practical, if you think that we should launch more like this, write a comment here, we would like to know your opinion, it is very important for us. Remember to subscribe, and you will be informed when we launch new videos. Thank you for watching, see you in next chapter. Be always welcome. Production, Universe Books Copyright 2016